everyone and welcome to our service on Sunday the 10th of January 2021. I trust you're all well and that you're able to cope with the new restrictions that came into force earlier this week. We're going to be continuing our series with kind permission from All Souls Langham Place when God asks the questions and today we're going to be looking at the question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 8, why are you so afraid? And our speaker this morning is Ollie Lansdowne. So last week we were focusing on bones and this week we're going to be focusing on water. There are lots of stories in the Bible about water and lots of images in the Bible about water. Uh, I think if we looked at all of them it would probably be a Bible study in its own right but we're just going to look at two short passages this morning. It won't surprise you that one of the readings is from the Psalms, Psalm 93. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The Lord is King, he is robed in majesty. Indeed the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, O Lord, is holy for ever and ever. And the second passage is from Isaiah 43 and the first three verses. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Let's join together now and praise our Father God, the one who holds the world and us in his hands. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God
Let's pray together. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, as we come this morning, we're aware of the need, the hurt, the brokenness around us in our world. Father, we thank you for your great love towards us through your son, Jesus. We pray for those who mourn. Please comfort them. We pray for those who are in distress. Please have compassion on them, Father. We pray for those who are broken hearted. May your spirit lift them and fill their hearts with praise. Lord, awaken your people to be salt and light in this hurting world. Help us to point people to Jesus, our living hope, our only hope in these difficult times. We pray for the leaders of our country who are having to make such difficult decisions. Please give them wisdom and help them to act from integrity and not from personal gain. We pray for those who are working for the NHS and healthcare professionals, that you would give them strength and compassion to cope with their daily tasks. We pray for teachers and others working in education as they seek to deliver lessons in a different way and for families working out the best way to homeschool. We pray for those struggling with ill health, whether mentally or physically. Lord, may all see their need of you and turn to you for salvation in this time of need. Be their hope, their light and their strength, we pray in the precious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to listen to our story this morning from Matthew chapter 8 from the Jesus Storybook Bible. The Jesus Storybook Bible, The Captain of the Storm, The Storm on the Lake from Mark 4 and Matthew 8. The sun was going down, the air was warm and still. Let's go across the lake, Jesus said to his friends. Jesus had been helping people all day and now he was tired. So they left the crowds at the shore and set out in a small fishing boat. Jesus climbed into the boat to take a nap. As soon as his head touched the pillow, he fell fast asleep. It was a beautiful evening. A gentle breeze rustled the sails. The friends were chatting happily as they headed out into the middle of the lake. Everything was perfect, just right for a nice, quiet sail. They were only about halfway across when, out of nowhere, whirling winds swept across the lake, fierce and strong like a hurricane. A blinding flash of lightning lit up the sky. Thunder roared right overhead. The storm blew the water into towering waves that hurled the little boat up, 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 then sent it hurtling, crashing back down, down, down. The fishing boat was blown and buffeted and tossed and turned back and forth and up and down and left and right and round and round and in the middle of the storm Jesus was sleeping now Jesus's friends had been fishermen all their lives but in all their years fishing on this lake they'd never once seen a storm like this one no matter how hard they struggled with their ropes and sails they couldn't control their boat the storm was too big for them But the storm wasn't too big for Jesus. Help, they screamed. Wake up, quick, Jesus. Jesus opened his eyes. Rescue us, save us, they shrieked. Don't you care? Of course Jesus cared, and this was the very reason he'd come, to rescue them and to save them. Jesus stood up and spoke to the storm. Hush, he said. That's all. And the strangest thing happened. The wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They'd heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus and they did what he said. Immediately, the wind stopped. The water calmed down. It glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat as if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness and a great quiet all around. 
Then Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends. Why were you scared? He asked. Did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears instead of me? Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves, and in their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this? They asked themselves anxiously. Even the winds and the waves obey him, they said, because they didn't understand. They didn't realize yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid. They had only seen the big waves. They'd forgotten that. If Jesus was with them, then they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big the storm. I've chosen this next song uh, because it refers to the incident that we've just seen of Jesus calming the storm. And it's probably not familiar to you, but it's a song by Chris Tomlin, which is called simply Jesus. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come There is one born for our salvation Jesus There is a light that overwhelms the darkness There is a kingdom that forever reigns There is freedom the chains that bind us, Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me, he rose like a lion, he bled as the lamb, he carried
Hi, I'm Rose and I'm a church assistant at All Souls and I will be reading the lesson today. Our reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 8 verses 23 to 27. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, my name is Ollie Lansdowne and I work with students here at All Souls. This evening we're continuing our series called When God Asks the Questions. What we've been doing is looking through the, the span of the scriptures at some of the questions that God has asked human beings. And um, we've been allowing these questions to scrutinize us. Our question for today, why are you so afraid? Is the question that Jesus asks to his disciples amidst the panic and fury of a storm at sea. The question he asks amidst battering winds and rolling thunder why are you so afraid? The question he asks as their boat is beaten and tossed about like a tea bag in Niagara, why are you so afraid? All of Jesus' questions have a purpose. What does Jesus want to do with this one? It was Jesus' fault they were out on the water in the first place. A crowd had begun to form, and in verse 18, Jesus gives orders for his disciples to go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 23, he gets into the boat and his disciples obediently follow him. Hardened Galilean fishermen who, within minutes, will become convinced that they are going to die. After a lifetime on the water, these fishermen are going to drown following a carpenter captain. Here's a question. Why does obediently following Jesus so often end up in thunder and lightning and crashing waves? We could talk to Noah. He was obedient to the Lord and it left him floating on raging floodwaters in a wooden ark for a full year. We could talk to Moses. His mother was obedient to the Lord, but for him, it meant being left in a papyrus basket on the edge of the river Nile to an unknown fate. We could talk to the people of Israel who followed the Lord out of Egypt and to the edge of the Red Sea only to find the armies of Egypt bearing down on them from behind and nothing but vast waters in front of them. We could talk to David who wrote psalm after psalm about the metaphorical torrent engulfing him because he had committed himself to following the Lord. Or we could talk to Jonah it was his disobedience that led him into a storm, but when he did submit to the Lord's will, it meant being thrown overboard and plunging into the depths of the Mediterranean Sea. Why does obediently following Jesus so often end up in thunder and lightning and overwhelming waves? This passage is going to show us. It's going to show us because it's going to show us the way of salvation. And in showing us the way of salvation, it's gonna show us the meaning of baptism and the shape of the whole Christian life. Because here's another question. What sort of God would baptize people? Have you ever asked that question? If you haven't, it might be because your understanding of baptism is a little bit quainter than it should be. What sort of God would baptize people? 
<laughs> Don't get me wrong. Seeing babies and children be baptised is one of my absolute favourite things. Might be the part of church that I've missed most during lockdown. It's beautiful. The child is brought to the front of church. God's promises are rehearsed. The godparents make promises in the child's name that they will grow up in the faith all of the days of their life. And the child is received into the church, God's covenant people, by washing and dipping or splashing with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's a beautiful thing. But it's worth pausing to consider what a very strange thing it is to baptise people, and especially babies. It's a very strange thing because of what the water in this font represents. The water in this font represents death. This is the water that flooded the whole earth, wiping out every living thing that wasn't in the ark with Noah. This is the water of the river Nile into which every Hebrew boy was thrown. This is the water of the Red Sea that terrified the Israelites and drowned the Egyptians. This is the torrential Mediterranean into which Jonah was plunged. These are the waters of Psalm 69, deep, sweeping flood waters, in which there is no foothold, no place to stand. Do you see why it is such a strange thing to baptise people, and especially to baptise children? When we baptise our babies, we are pouring death on their heads. These waters are the waters of death. If your child makes a real fuss while getting baptised, well, take heart, because maybe it's because they've realised what it is that baptism means. Mum, this man is trying to drown me in death. <laughs> Aren't you going to do something? When we baptise our babies, we are pouring death on their heads. The waters of baptism are the waters of death. Why does obediently following Jesus so often lead to thunder and lightning and flood? What sort of God would baptise people? This passage is going to show us, and we've got two points. First, the God who delivers through water. And second, the God who disciplines through water. What sort of God would baptise people? First, the God who delivers through water. The God in whose name we are baptised is the God who delivers through water. He's done it before and he can do it again. The disciples, battered by thunderclouds, would have known the ancient stories of Jonah and Israel and Moses and Noah. They would have known that their God is the God of Noah, the God who preserved the ark, guiding Noah and those with him to safety through that devastating flood. They would have known that their God is the God of Moses, the God who parted the Red Sea, making a way through its mighty waters for his people so that they could pass through on dry ground, no child left behind. They would have known that their God is the God of Jonah, the God who stilled the Mediterranean and saved Jonah's life even as he sank into the very heart of the seas. The disciples would have known that their God is the God who delivers through water because they would have known with Jonah and Moses and Noah and David that their God is the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Mightier than the thunder of great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty, says the psalmist. But when the flood waters overwhelm you, you don't act on what your head knows, you act on what your heart trusts. Where do the disciples' hearts cause them to look? Who do they call on in their distress? They call on Jesus. They look to Jesus. They turn to Jesus. The disciples knew that their God is the God who delivers through water. And in turning to Jesus, they are turning to that God. Our title for today is, Why Are You So Afraid? The question with which Jesus rebukes the disciples when they call on him. And we'll get to that rebuke in a moment, but please don't think that the disciples are anything less than an example for us to follow in this instance. They are rebuked for having little faith, 
but not for having no faith at all. At the end of this passage, we find the disciples asking, who is this man? And that really does seem like negligibly small faith, doesn't it? They're not even able to say who Jesus is. Well, their faith may be small, but Jesus is still able to discern it. Verse 25, they don't ask Jesus to ask the Lord to save them. They ask the Lord Jesus to save them, even though they're fishermen and he is a carpenter. They are looking to Jesus as the God who delivers through waters, the God of Noah and Moses and Jonah. Jesus rebukes the disciples for having little faith, but not for having no faith at all. Friends, is that not reason to take heart this evening? Jesus is able to discern the difference. Does your faith feel negligibly small? Well, the size of our faith is not the measure of his salvation. Take heart. No matter how small your faith may be, Jesus is able to discern it. And his salvation is always comprehensive. Look at how he responds to the little faith of the disciples. Verse 26, the God of Noah, Moses and Jonah responds with the voice of the God of Genesis. Did you see that? Did you see how Jesus brings peace to these stormy waters? Verse 26, by speaking. Jesus' words order the oceans. The waters listen to the words of Jesus because they recognize the voice of their creator. Jesus' words ordered the oceans in Genesis 1 and in Matthew 8, they are still obeying his voice. Jesus is the God of salvation because Jesus is the God of creation. He created the world out of nothing and he can bring salvation and hope out of just as little. What is overwhelming us in 2020? Stupid question, Ollie. So many things. This pandemic is overwhelming. Looking in your diary, wondering how many more meals you'll have to eat alone looking in your inbox and wondering how many more balls you're going to drop, a to-do list that only gets bigger when you start completing it. Looking in your bank and wondering whether to pay for petrol or school uniform. Injustice is overwhelming, staring down the street at another police car, wondering how many times you'll be pulled over instead of your white friends. Staring past the man who's staring at you, holding your keys between your fingers like you joke you do with your friends. Staring at your exam results, wondering why your future is being decided by your postcode. Psalm 69 is truly a psalm for the church in 2020. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters, the floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. All souls, do you know that Jesus holds the reins of this world? Do you know that the God who ordered this world into being orders it still? Do you know that his word silences heaven and reigns on earth? When you feel utterly empty and hopeless this week, remember the entire hope of the Christian is in the God who can bring something out of nothing. And the size of our faith isn't the measure of his salvation. When the floodwaters threaten to overwhelm and engulf us, let's turn with the disciples to the one who holds their reins. When the raging world overwhelms you, Christian, remember your baptism. You were baptized in the name of the God of Noah and Moses and Jonah, the God of heaven who formed the sea and the dry land out of nothing. Our God is the God who delivers through water. Let's take a moment to turn to him now.
We're in Matthew 8, and we've been asking the question, what sort of God would baptize people? This passage gives us two answers. First, the God who delivers through water. Jesus is the God who ordered the oceans into being and orders them still. But let's go back to that question with which Jesus rebukes his disciples, the title of today's sermon. Why are you so afraid? You can imagine what the disciples might be thinking. Because, Jesus, I am about to die. Because even if you hold the reins of these waves, do I really need to be here while you rein them in? Jesus, can't you just come and get me when you're done? What sort of God baptizes people? First, the God who delivers through water. And second, the God who disciplines through water. Did you notice the order in which Jesus' rebukes come in verse 26? Before Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves, he rebukes his disciples. Even while the boat is threatening to break apart beneath him, even while the sea is opening its abyss, Jesus' attention is fixed on the disciples. Verse 26, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Before he calms the fury of the waves, he concerns himself with the disciples' fear. Jesus is in the business of recreation. But before he finishes recreating his world, he's reforming his church. Because the deepest work God is doing isn't something out there. It's something in here. The deepest work God is doing is not to calm the fury of the world, it's to calm the church's fear and grow the church's faith. Why does following Jesus so often end up in thunder and lightning and overwhelming waters? Because he wants to wake us up. Because he is reorienting our hearts. Jesus went to sleep in verse 24, but he did it to wake his disciples up in verse 25. He led them into a storm to reorient their hearts. What do we mean when we say that we fear something? When I fear something, every one of my thoughts and movements and ligaments is directed towards the object of my fears. If I'm in the same room as a lion, I won't do anything without thinking about that lion. Every decision I make, oriented around that lion. Every thought, lion. Every impulse, lion. Even who I am is now defined in relation to my fear, not the other way around. I'm in the same room as the lion. The lion is not in the same room as me. Fearing something means that the object of your fears has become so fully impressed onto every inch of who you are, that it's impressed onto every hour of what you do. It's as though you've been made into a secondary character in your own life's story. 
What is it that you fear like that? What has captured your whole body's orientation? For the people of Israel, at the edge of the Red Sea, it was the armies of Egypt. For the disciples, in their fishing boat on the Sea of Galilee, it was a life-threatening storm. What is it for you? What has stolen your entire orientation? Generally, it's only when we fear and face imminent danger that our entire body reorients itself onto one particular thing. It tends to be, doesn't it, bad things that so thrust themselves into our imagination that our whole lives are reoriented so that all our attention is directed towards that single thing. Lion, flood, Egypt, storm. But there is one moment in this story where the disciples take their eyes off the storm and turn themselves to the sleeping Jesus. Verse 25, look with me. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And as soon as Jesus has their attention, he keeps it. The operation has begun. Verse 26, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. These disciples have just undergone heart surgery. These disciples have just undergone a full-bodied reorientation. A moment ago, their entire attention was on the storm. Now, their every thought is Jesus. Generally, it is only bad things and negative experiences that reorient our entire lives so dramatically. But with Jesus, it's the exact opposite. To fear Jesus is to have encountered one so righteous, so wise, so vastly good, that everything about who you are is now reoriented towards that one devastating fountain of glory. To fear Jesus means your every thought and your every movement and your every habit is now directed towards him. You've been made a secondary character in your own life story. Your life is no longer your own. You've had a full-bodied reorientation. If anyone else does that to you, it is horrifying. But your whole life being reoriented towards Jesus is life itself. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he got into the boat and told his disciples to follow him. He knew exactly what he was doing when he lay down to sleep. He knew exactly what he was doing as the sea whipped itself into foam and fear gripped the disciples' hearts. He was revealing their fear, ready to reorient it. He was waking up their faith so as to enliven it. This is the God who taught faith to Noah as his ark floated on the floodwaters for a full year. This is the God who taught faith to the Israelites as they faced Egyptians behind them and the Red Sea around them. This is the God who taught faith to Jonah as he sank to the bottom of the Mediterranean and the God who taught faith to David as he sought a place to stand. All souls, if our God brings us through the waters of death this year, it is because he is committed to our reformation. If it seems as though our God has fallen asleep, maybe it's because he's trying to wake us up. There's a danger in years like 2020 that we think all of our problems are external. If only there was a vaccine, if only we had a better government, if only we had saved more diligently or I'd studied harder. The storm is real 
and it is raging. And friends, one day Jesus will rein it in. But if all of those problems were fi fixed, we would still be left with our biggest problem. Not out there, but in here. Our biggest problem is not the object of our temporary fears. It is the orientation of our hearts. Our biggest problem isn't what we think we fear. It is our lack of faith. This pandemic has been a judgment in the truest sense of the world, revealing what we are really like, telling us who we really are. And friends, it turns out I am not a good person. I am pride shot through with anxiety. I am jealousy mingled with meanness. I am all sorts of fear and faithlessness. And I am very slow to trust God when I'm scared. If it hasn't already, this pandemic may well break us clean apart. But God only breaks to reform. If it looks like he is sleeping, it's only to wake us up. He leads us through storms to reorient our hearts. He brings us through the waters of death to calm our fears and grow our faith. What sort of God would baptize his followers? The God who delivers and disciplines his people. All Souls 2020 may well have many more unwelcome surprises. When the floodwaters threaten to engulf us, how are we going to respond? If you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus this evening, can I say thank you so much for listening for so long? Let me say something especially to you, and it's this. This is the only way. The only way beyond the storm is through it. I think Michael Rosen actually said it best in this book. We can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've got to go through it. That's the meaning of baptism. That's the meaning of Christian baptism. The only way past these waters of death is to go through these waters of death. The only way beyond 2020 is through 2020. The only way beyond the storm is through it. And the only way through it is with Jesus. When the storm threatens to engulf you, will you turn to the God who holds their reins? If this pandemic doesn't get you, something else will. The flood of death is inevitable and irrepressible. The only way beyond death is through death. And the only way through death is with Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus this evening, let me ask you Jesus's question. Why are you so afraid? 2020 has given us a lot of answers to that question. Pandemic, financial collapse, totalitarian rule, white supremacy. But even while 2020 is raging, Jesus is asking us that question, why are you so afraid? Christian, remember your baptism. You have passed through these floodwaters. You have passed through the Nile. You have passed through the Red Sea and the Mediterranean and the raging Sea of Galilee. Jesus will deliver us through these waters. Jesus will discipline us through these waters. Turn to him. Let's pray together using words from Isaiah 43 and a prayer based on the Church of England's baptism service. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Almighty and everlasting God, who mercifully saved Noah and his family in the ark from perishing by water, and who safely led the children of Israel, your people, through the waters of the Red Sea, thereby figuring your holy baptism, look in mercy on us. Wash us, sanctify us, 
deliver us and keep us in the ark of Christ's church. Discipline us to be firm in faith, joyful through hope and rooted in love, so that passing through the waters of this troubled world, we may finally come to the land of everlasting life, there to reign with you, world without end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun the Lord is my salvation He will call me. 